<coughs> presentation by Professor Parak Kupati and uh, certainly the chairperson was taken by surprise because he was taking a totally different view of anti-majoritarianism and uh, that is uh, part of his argument, argument craft that he really took it to a different direction. Now, comprehending uh, the rise of socio of socio-economic jurisprudence in India, uh, Shovik Malik is the next uh, presenter. So, socio-economic jurisprudence in India, comprehending the rise or comprehending the demise. Uh, I think. <laughs> First of all, I would like to clarify that I am not Sonic Malik, so that it is not a case of impersonation. <laughs> My, I am Dinesh Singh, Research Associate and Research Assistant to Professor M.P. Singh. And uh, I thank Professor M.P. Singh and Shobhanik for giving me this opportunity. On behalf of Shobhanik, he is presenting this. Definitely. Yes, sir. First of all, I would like to thank Sonic, doctoral candidate at uh, Yale University in Social Anthropology, uh, for giving me this opportunity to present his paper. And author has also asked me to note down any comments, suggestions you have for him so that he could develop this paper into a larger piece. So it's kind of a working paper which he is working right now on. Uh, the title of the paper is Comprehending the Rise of Socio-Economic Jurisprudence in India. Uh, author starts his paper and I would like to miss, like to quote it verbatim uh, since uh, I cannot summarize the paper without putting into my, putting into it my interpretations and personal prejudices. So I would like to uh, quote substantial portions of the paper uh, as it is verbatim. Uh, author mentions Aditya Kabila's uh, statements about the enchantment of state as it affects different sections of society as elite uh, is attached to the state because they want to uh, have in control of the society and the state ensures that. And for poorer, uh, the state is a uh, instrumentality for improvement in their situation. Uh, the persistent legitimacy of Indian state is to a large extent due to this paradox. Uh, this intervention of the Supreme Court into this paradox and the rest of the judiciary, obviously, for much of its history, either by accident or design, has affected this paradox. Uh, for the courts, uh, participate in collaborate in governing India, what has been the nature of these interventions is the question. And how has these uh, interventions play into the constitutional scheme over time for India. So, author is harping upon these two questions and uh, in the course of this short essay, he visits some of those queries with select comments along with a brief discussion of the making of social rights jurisprudence of India and its relationship to the changing democratic and political life in India. Uh, the primary consequence of these interventions which the judiciary as a whole has made uh, as author puts it, arguably, has been the elevation and promotion of social and economic rights by Supreme Court uh, through either the direct enforcement of existing constitutional provisions or creating uh, or creatively expanding their scope when they have been found wanting. Uh, before further commenting upon it and on the trends of social rights jurisprudence, author looks upon the evolution of social rights jurisprudence from the 19th century that is from the start of the revolt of 1857 and the formation of Indian National Congress and uh, followed by the uh, the first constitutional constitution of India bill 1895 that is the author puts it as the first constitutional document uh, pr providing for the uh, free speech detention only by competent authorities and a list of fundamental rights as such like free, free state education and all. Uh, again, in the next constitutional demand, followed by Ms. Uh, Basin's Commonwealth of India Bill of 1925, in which the demand of fundamental rights was repeated, uh, which was further elaborative in its approach than to the uh, Constitution of India Bill 1895, in the nature that it demanded uh, civil and political rights as elaborative as personal liberty, freedom of conscience, free expression of opinion, fr free assembly, equality before law and non-discrimination on the basis of sex and uh, along with them it also demanded certain social rights such as free elementary education, equal rights to use roads, courts and all other places and businesses and resource dedicated to the public. Now, followed by this, in 1927 the Indian National Congress resolved to deliberate with other parties 
to draft a constitution of India uh, with a list of rights to be placed in the All Parties Conference of 1928. And this committee was chaired by Motilal Nehru, uh, which reported on the importance of inclusion of fundamental rights in the constitution and listed among them social rights, prominently the right to education. Uh, now, this was somehow uh, was marked a break by the Karachi Resolution of 1931 which placed fundamental rights and duties together and included separate heads on labor and economic social program. Now this Karachi, uh, this Karachi resolution under the labor heading, it provided for the organization of economic life that, I quote, must conform to the principle of justice, comma, to the end that it may secure a decent standard of living, unquote. Safeguarding of the interest of industrial workers and securing for them, quote, a living wage, healthy conditions of work, limited hours of labor, suitable machinery for the settlement of disputes, and alongside them are several other labor rights. This Karachi resolution also demanded certain economic and social program to be included among others, which provided for protection of indigenous industries against foreign competition, state ownership or control of key industries and services, mineral resources, railways, waterways, shipping and other means of public transport, and relief and agriculture indebtedness and control of usury. Uh, the resolution, as uh, Granville Austin says, have played, I quote, a vital share in shaping India's future constitution and its provision did in fact were direct antecedents of the DPs, that is the directory principles of state policy. Uh, it did not draw any difference between the positive or the social rights on one hand and the negative or civil and political rights on the other. It is only in 1945 that the Sabru Committee report classified the rights into justiciable and non-justiciable rights, which was later maintained by the Fundamental Rights Committee of the Constituent Assembly and finally led to the division between the fundamental right and the directive principles of state policy in the constitution, uh, making the later one obviously non-justiciable in nature by virtue of Article 37 of it. Uh, thus, while some of the socio-economic rights that founded their place among the fundamental right became justiciable, and uh, the rest that went into the directive principles portion were remained unknown justiciable. There is no doubt that whatever disparity that might have existed in the earlier decades of 20th century between civil and political rights on the one hand and the social and economic rights on the other uh, can no longer be argued, argued to be argued to be existing uh, on the basis of rationale and justification as uh, of the same of civil and political rights and social and economic rights are all founded on the recognition of human dignity, protection of which is the foundation of all political societies. Uh, now, for the concept of dignity, author here calls Dworkin. Uh, he says that Dworkin writes that dignity demands a decent life worth living and capable of realizing for each and every individual the goal of living well. Uh, such a life is dependent upon the satisfaction or fulfillment of certain minimum conditions, although the scope for variation in those conditions may not be ruled out at the current level of commonly accepted understanding that they include access to nutrition or food and water, housing, healthcare and education as we may put it. Uh, theoretically speaking, the development of the two set of rights can be explained thus that uh, one might have followed the other. That means the social economic rights might have followed the civil and political rights. Uh, for this author puts in that uh, uh, the civil and political rights uh, ensured restrictions on the political organization in the realization of an individual's full potential. And, uh, this, uh, and the other ones, that is the social and economic rights, uh, followed these rights only because of their these, uh, capabilities and uh, uh, qualities of these kind of rights. Uh, the civil and political rights, apart from this, help in achieving the goal of effective democratic state and also calls this goal as was well achieved for demand for the establishment of a caring state. So, he says that only once this goal of effective democratic state is achieved, only then uh, we could achieve the demand for the establishment of a caring state, ensuring a life worth living that was, according to Dworkin, the concept of dignity uh, or dignified life could naturally follow from it. Uh, this demand has now, especially since 1970s, come to the forefront and has placed the social economic rights as at the same level as civil and political rights, although former followed the latter. Uh, the consequence of these changes in perception as it reflects on redistribution of wealth and equality measures across society is well captured by Rosenwallen in his book, The Society of Equals. The second arc of Rosenwallen's history 
consists of the rise of the redistributive state from the late 1800s to the early 1970s and its decline since then. But the account of equality during measures in the 19th century is fairly persuasive. Uh, when author calls this, he says that sometimes immediate changes in the socio-economic rights were more due to the pressures of society itself rather than through the changing mindset of the paternalistic government. Uh, or to put it differently, the changes emerged from political and intellectual development. And to explain this, author gives example of from uh, the period of Bismarck's government in Germany, uh, where the adoption of social insurance is credited to what Rosenwald called uh, the reformism of fear, I am called, uh, rather than changes in the economy, with militant trade unions and radical movements of anarchist and communist posing a genuine threat. Many governments realized that reform was necessary in order to avoid revolution. And uh, similar changes followed on both the sides of Atlantic with governments introducing the central elements of the modern welfare state, progressive taxation, social insurance and regulations and protecting labor so as to avoid re revolution from the uh, masses or the subaltern I would rather put. Uh, and this idea has been rather put by B. R. Ambedkar uh, in his very, very well known speech. I, I uh, may not uh, read it in full, but uh, to give you the idea, we are, go we are going to enter into a life of contradictions in politics, we shall be recognizing the principle of uh, one man, one vote, one value in our social and economic life, we shall be, by reason of economic structure, continue to deny this principle and so on. Uh, thus the idea of transformational constitutionalism according to Sovenik is that, is simply to put it, putting, in, putting this idea of achieving social transformation through the constitution as was part of the imagination of our constitution framers. Uh, in fact, it can be argued according to him that such priority given to social transformation was necessity for the existence of a stable constitutional order. And uh, the recognition of this urgent requirement by the constituent assembly in achieving social transformation is uh, also emblem em emblematic of the willingness of the elite social order which created the constitutional structures. That, that means the, the members who were part of our uh, constituent assembly were from provinces and most of them were from the elite sections of the society. Uh, this engagement was very necessary as he has stated earlier for the new democracy to survive and grow. The process of interaction of the two do domains, elites and subalterns, as now he puts it, of the society has been well captured by Partha Chatterjee uh, in Nation and its Fragments, where Partha Chatterjee states that, I quote, the willingness of the elite domain of politics to engage and negotiate with the arena of subaltern politics for the purpose of producing consent with the ultimate objective of dominating subaltern politics shows the acknowledgement of elites of the very real presence of subaltern politics. Uh, furthermore, unquote, uh, such engagement over time has produced mutually conditioned historicity. Now, whose marks are to be noted in the project of nationalist modernity? It can also be seen that subaltern politics over time has become familiar with and sometimes adept at negotiating the institutional forms and nature of elite politics. But in this kind of engagement of the elite and subaltern domain of politics, the judiciary has played a crucial part, sometimes as an arbiter of disputes between the two domains and at other times diffusing tensions and forwarding the cause of constitutional democracy through carefully crafted judicial pronouncements, which have often negated the need for elongated and often bitter political battles between these two domains of elites and subalterns. The judiciary, particularly the Supreme Court and some of the leading high courts through their social economic rights jurisprudence since the late 1970s, post the political emergency of 1975, what uh, he terms it as uh, uh, under the court's interventions has also created a wide popularity for itself which has granted it broad legitimacy amongst the masses. This is easily seen through the explosion in the filling of public interest litigations from the 1970s onwards which ultimately uh, rise after 1970s and the dockets of the courts. The judicial decision making on issues like environmental protection, nuisance and the expansion of right to life has progressed the cause of socio-economic rights by years and decades since there was a lack of consensus on the part of the legislative to act on these issues and the caution as such that it is the nature of the developing country constitutional structures that often the judiciary is needed to fill the void in areas which arguably might be the zone of legislative leading 
into certain conflicts of separation of power. Now, uh, the activist courts of South Africa, India and other developing countries are evidence of this trait. In India, since the beginning of the millennium, social rights such as the right to education, right to information, nutrition, health care, housing, social security, all have been put on sound constitutional and legislative footing. Uh, in recent years, the domain of subaltern politics, adequately supported by social organizations which uh, are called as NGOs in India, has shown remarkably ability, uh, remarkable ability in understanding and acting for its own benefit through social political mobilizations and legal channels. Now, this mobilization by these NGOs uh, is due to a convergence of agitation by those concerned and the response of the judiciary. Uh, author puts that uh, the recent Delhi election in which uh, the Aam Army Party won 67 seats out of 70 uh, was because of the was largely because and backed by the immigrant population of auto drivers in Delhi uh, and catering to the and this led to the catering to the needs of the lower class and lower middle class uh, this party was able to means which was phenomenally a uh, larger win in the history of Delhi politics uh, and by a very new party which has never tested the assembly elections apart from the ones it earlier got uh, into the Hung Assembly. So, author puts this that this is parallel to the political movement in Delhi as which has been the trend of social economic uh, socio-economic judgments delivered by the Delhi High Court in recent years such as decisions on winter housing for the homeless uh, and the requirement of government providing for the cost of expensive medicines when certain criteria are met. The decisions of the judiciary, as the author puts in, I will, and I would like to conclude by putting it, that uh, sometimes act, as argued earlier, in the nature of interventions, uh, as he has already called it, which actively mediate between the elite and the subaltern domains, sometimes a charge of playing to the gallery, which author doesn't consider to be appropriate, since uh, in, a, in a third world country like India, as uh, it is uh, to call the court uncharitable and even calling downright irresponsible to call uh, its uh, social rights jurisprudence and development of the same by it. Uh, the substantial portion of the population in the country below poverty line and you cannot call the, this, this jurisprudence put in by the courts uh, uh, as uh, calling it maybe playing to the galleries or maybe you cannot cast such aspersions on court where majority of the population is below poverty line as uh, what I could get from his uh, uh, idea and lastly he puts that the progress in social rights jurisprudence has not been linear in nature however I argue that it has certainly advanced the cause of equality and when the cause of equality has lost out in some dimensions it has nevertheless gained in others as I have seen in recent decades when equality for women and gays has advanced even as economic inequalities have increased with the advent of liberalization in India. So this is basically what Sovnik's uh, idea of uh, comprehension of the rise of socio-economic jurisprudence in India is and we would hopefully like some critical comments uh, for expanding the domain of this paper from you all. Thank you. for presenting Shovik's paper and I think uh, Shovik has created a hope that things are not that bad. There is a slow but uh, perceptible rise of uh, socio-economic jurisprudence, rights jurisprudence in India and I think uh, this is uh, certainly, there are some indicators but uh, that is uh, the questions, the interventions by... Now the last paper of this session is uh, to be presented by Mr. Neeraj Kumar, the paper of uh, Liu Jian Long of uh, the University of uh, China, mm -hmm. Beijing. Uh, Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you for clarifying that I am not actually you. <laughs> so, in a way, I consider it as one of the small ways in, the, in which I can uh, express my gratitude towards one of my teachers in my uh, life uh, as a law student. Uh, not if, not, if not most significant, at least one of the most significant teachers. So, uh, Dr. Liu's paper is on uh, judicial interpretation in China. 
and the title of the paper itself is fascinating in the sense that by and large, as a common law scholar, we understand that the power of judicial review is not available to the Chinese Superior Court. So, as uh, Dinesh has done, so similarly, by and large, I will be quoting extensively and reading verbatim what he has written. So, he starts with, in China, the power to interpret the constitution and the statutes is deliberately vested in the Standing Committee of National People's Congress by the Constitution of People's Republic of China and its predecessors. As a result, it is held that not a Chinese court, neither the Supreme People's Court, nor any of its, its inferiors was entitled to the so-called powers to interpret a statute. Hence, it would be nonsense to justify attempts to incorporate judicial review or constitutional review into the process of legal interpretation. In other words, an issue challenging the constitutionality of a law or the legality of a rule or of a regulation could be simply rejected by the pending court for the wanting of judicial jurisdiction. Such a rejection will be further justified since section 12 clause 2 of administrative litigation law even rules out the, the judiciability of administrative regulation adopted by the state council, administrative orders adopted by the ministries of the state council or provincial governments or alike, and any other decisions and orders adopted by administrative organs of the general binding, which is apparently hierarchical lower to hierarchically lower to the law. In this regard, it would be argued that the roles and the functionalities of Chinese courts, both the Supreme People Court and its inferiors, are much more limited and constrained than that of their counterparts in other countries, especially the Western ones. However, to the extent that the so-called abstractive public general interpretation of law, or rather the lawmaking, by the Supreme People's Court of China has been taken into account, it seems that the above assertions is not plausible and sustainable. To the contrary, the court could be much more powerful and competent than its counterpart in the world. Even though the latter has always been criticized for being too active in lawmaking, though not only the legality and legitimacy of Supreme Court's power uh, to interpret a law passed by NPC or her standing committee, either case-oriented or generally, is highly constitutionally disputed for wants of expressive authorization by the prescriptions of constitution and laws but also the dominative ideology of the ruling party and the government. Also, the Supreme Court itself and some scholars strongly criticize and reject the possibility of introducing any model of judicial interpretation of law that is based on the separation of powers or might give birth to the so-called capitalist institution of judicial oblique constitutional review, either a Anglo-Saxon one or a continental one. The practices of legal interpretation by the Supreme Court, or occasionally by its inferior courts, a high court, has been long established, and to large extent, the judicial interpretation of law is viewed as not less binding than the law interpreted. In this regard, the roles and the functionaries of the Supreme Court have caught so much great attention and sparked off heated debates. Last decades have witnessed the Supreme Court swaying between radicalism and conservatism. Accordingly, the judicial interpretation of law has either been highly praised and valued for the important and active role it played and is playing, or criticized of hindering China's legalization and modernization and endangering, sorry, it's only engendering the human right against the infringement and violation hereof by the public powers, which has opened up and reformed since 1978 onwards or both. In this article, Dr. Liu tried to make a comprehensive and structural investigation in judicial interpretation of China. So in part one starts with concept of judicial interpretation. So he says, the answer to the question what the term judicial interpretation exactly stands for is self-evident where written constitution or prevailing constitutional conventions and practices embodied the doctrine of separation of powers. However, so far in China, the endeavors to work out a comprehensive and all-considered definition of judicial interpretation did not lead to any persuasive outcomes but remained in vain. Therefore, it was said that the judicial interpretation is indefinable. However, a definition, even inappropriate, might be helpful to further the understanding of the object to be discussed, especially in a civil law context. Hence, he tries to come out with a definition of judicial interpretation. So, he uh, divides the understanding in two uh, periods. So, the first period is 1949 to 78. So he continues, after the establishment of People's Republic of China, the leaders and its government decided to make a complete and throughout break 
uh, which is passed besides the legal system thereof. However, the evolution of old legal system did not follow the blooming of a new one. Since the legal system was viewed as an instrument for class struggle against the enemies of the state, a guideline dominating was that the that within quote unquote to be more general is much better than to be concretized unquote. While a much more general law would give the authorities more space and discretionary power to handle the class enemies, hence was regarded more effective and preferred. Therefore, during this period, there were only a few laws. Uh, 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 most of the dispute and the cases were decided according to the political policies. It is said that for a long time, the People's Republic of China even hadn't a single court to regulate the criminal justice, not to mention other issues. Because of the flexibility and inapplicability of such policies, interpretation and concretization thereof were necessary to enable the courts to carry out their work. On June of 1955, the Standing Committee of National People's Congress adopted the resolution on matters of legal interpretation, which provided that the matters concerning the application of law or the orders of law in a concrete case arose in the process of trial ought to be handled according to the interpretations of such law and orders of a law made by the Judicial Committee of the Supreme Court. Consequently, a unitary institution of judicial interpretation was established and remained unchanged until being replaced by a hybrid system in 1979. Thereafter, many categories of judicial interpretation appeared, including reply, answer, letter, notice, opinion, provision, resolution, and phone call, and so on. Most of the judicial interpretations are exactly the interpretation and explanation of the policies of the Chinese Communist Party. Among them, only a few are namely the interpretation of provisions of law. Moreover, the process of judicial interpretation was not well regulated and hence full of chaos and disorder. Then the second stage he classifies as 1971 or 78 onward. In order to put the social and political order on the right track, more and more laws were made to meet the demands of speedy changes of the society. However, due to the poor qualities of the laws made, the poor educations of the justices, as a whole, and the fascinating changes undergoing hence since 1980s, the judicial interpretation has experienced an unprecedented prosperity. In 1997, a further attempt to normalize the practices of judicial interpretation was undertaken by the court itself by the making of provisions of Supreme People's Court on the judicial interpretation work. The provisions has provided an, a comprehensive regulation on the forms, processes and according to a judicial interpretation made by the court is to be titled as interpretation oblique explanation provisions in reply to or resolution according to the classifications laid down by the provisions and then to be published on the supreme people court's report among the four the term resolution was firstly added by section 9 of the provisions of the supreme people's court on the judicial interpretation work of 1997 by the end of 1999, the quantity of judicial interpretation amounted to about 1300 and been continually accumulating. By the end of 2004, the quantity is about 7600. Moreover, according to the judicial interpretation have to some extent regarded by the judges, the courts and the lawyers as the main resource of law and the canons for judicial adjudication. Though by the leading scholars in China, the judicial interpretations were Self them, uh, seldom uh, classified and recognized as a written source of law as the constitution, the legislations and the statutory orders were, the judicial interpretation in abstractive sense are, expect, uh, are accepted as one of the main resources of law either for its form or its contents. In practices they are even given the priority over the laws thereof by the courts and the judges, which is evidently inconsistent with the sovereignty of the National People's Congress. So then he talks about categories of judicial interpretation and he says, generally speaking in two instances, the mechanism of judicial interpretation might be uh, categorized. First is ex officio or abstract interpretation, which means the interpretation of law performed by the Supreme People's Court in the context of the cases handled and dealt thereby or as a result of her inquiries and researches relevant. This kind of legal interpretation is termed as abstractive or general interpretation. They always take place in such a form after the National People's Congress or the Standing Committee makes, revises or amends a law 
the Supreme People's Court will come out with so-called judicial interpretation of the provision thereof, of its concern without any concrete cases coming up. The origin and the development of an abstractive judicial interpretation to some extent is due to the inaccuracies and chaos of the legislation, the poor educated and trained judges, and the want of mechanism of precedence. Second category is interpretation upon request by lower courts or incidental oblique concrete interpretation. According to the provisions of laws and the judicial interpretation, for example, when a lower court come across some rules of law of uncertainty, ambiguousness, or out of date, and hence an interpretation of the law concerned is unavoidable, the court should suspend the pending case and refer the questions of law to its immediate higher courts and on finally to the Supreme People's Court for her explanations. Whatever decisions the Supreme People's Court make is binding for the lower court, which means that the <coughs> trial court should come out with their adjudication in accordance with the Supreme People's Court interpretation of law. Though such interpretations are held to be not generally applicable or binding, the lower court judges dare not deviate from them in other cases, even, in, if, even if they are of the opinion that the laws made by the Supreme Court are not uh, are not more than a bad one. And then uh, he talks about judicial interpretation in normative perspective. So the judicial interpretation in normative perspective focus on the question what the judicial interpretation is prescribed. In accordance with the proponents of judicial interpretation, the following statutes or resolution are held to be the basis and grounds justifying the existence of judicial interpretation. First, the Standing Committee Resolution on Interpretation of Law 1955, of which Section 2 provided that the question of how to apply the laws and statutory orders to a concrete case in the process of trial is to be explained by the Supreme People's Court. Second, Section 33 of the Organic Law of People's Court, 1979, and its revisions in 1983, 1986, and 2006 just repeated the Section 2 of Ever Resolution. Section 2 of the Standing Committee Resolution on Enforcing Legal Interpretation 1981, which prescribed that the problems concerning the application of laws and statutory orders to a concrete case in trial process is to be explained by Supreme People's Court. While that raises in a prosecuting field the Supreme People's Procur Procuratorate, so uh, we were told by Dr. Surya in the previous class that is something similar to prosecution, something similar to part and parcel of judicial being. Uh, whenever a principal disagreement exists, it should be referred to the Standing Committee for her explanation or determination. However, the validity of the statutes and the resolution mentioned above is apparently questionable. Firstly, the Constitution and its predecessors clearly vested the power to interpret the law into the Standing Committee of National People's Congress under Article 31 3 of the Constitution 1954 provided that the Standing Committee of National People's Congress exercises the following power to interpret the law. And that's why in China we call it as a legislative review uh, rather than seeing it as a judicial review. Uh, Article 25, Clause 3 of the Constitution, 1978, also reiterated that it is the Standing Committee of National People's Congress function to interpret the Constitution and the law and to make statutory orders. Article 67, Clause 1 of the Constitution, 1982, is in the same position with its predecessors. Even the legislation law 2000 that concretized the rules of lawmaking and statutory interpretation of the Constitution said nothing about the power to interpret the law of the Supreme People's Court. Therefore, in accordance with the doctrine of express mention, thus the power to interpret the law is exclusively and expressly delegated to the Standing Committee, but not any other branch of the government, as well the uh, Supreme People's Court. In respect of this challenge, the proponents of the judicial interpretation further offers another defense that the constitution may have been amended or changed in the course of evolving, which is sufficient to justify the judicial interpretation. Though in China, take the reality into account, it may be right to say that law could be amended and revised by another one in a way without express indication. One must be aware of the amending or revising of law in such a way is inconsistent with Article 53 Clause 2 of Legislation Law 2000, let alone the amending or revising of such a fundamental law as the Constitution, which has clearly and expressly prescribed the amending procedure. To say the least, that the power to interpret the law does exist according to the laws and the resolution mentioned above, it would be hard to define it. By reading the legislation law into the organic law of the People's Court and the two resolutions together, one is bound to 
find out the judicial interpretation should not be what it is since most of them provided that. So a law shall be interpreted by the standing committee of the National People's Congress if first the specific meaning of provisions needs to be further defined or two after its enactment new developments make it necessary to define the basis on which to apply the law. Let alone these two instances, it would be hard to imagine what the concept of interpretations of laws would, could be, even though one may try to distinguish the general legal interpretation from the case-oriented interpretation of law and to justify the judicial interpretation for uh, his summits, for him, such an idea is definitely nonsensical while the reality of the judicial interpretation is considered Furthermore, it would also be uh, unbelievable that a so-called case-oriented interpretation of law could be separated from the general legal interpretation, especially in hard cases. Then he talks about nature of judicial interpretation power. As the nature of judicial interpretation power is concerned, the opinion thereof. Okay, yeah, I'm just coming to. I'm just leaving everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As the nature of the judicial interpretation power is concerned. So it is 22 pages and I am just reading all, I don't think more than 4 pages I have read. <laughs> the risk factor is that I must not say something which goes contrary to his <laughs> Yeah, so you can see that out of these 2 pages I am reading just one. <laughs> that is the minimum which I could do. As the nature of judicial interpretation power is concerned, the opinion thereof very thoroughly and sharply. In short, there are 2 basic propositions generally offered. One is, in the favor of judicial interpretation power and it could be further divided into sub two sub propositions a1 holds that the judicial interpretation power is a constituent is constituted or inherited inherent power enjoyed by the court and b the other holds that the judicial interpretation power is a power sub delegated by the standing committee the other opinion against it argues that the practices of judicial interpretation by the court is unjustified and illegitimate and not more than a transgression of the standing committee's legal interpretation power So effectiveness of judicial interpretation in the reply on how to cite normative documents of law and legal documents of October 8, 1986, the court deliberately pointed out the provisions and the replies on the enforcement of law should be applied and enforced. However, it may not be appropriate to cite them directly in legal documents. And as a critique, he mentions that human rights protection and judicial radicalism or conservatism. He says that Supreme People's Court has always been criticized either for judicial radicalism or conservatism. To label the court as judicial radical, radical is to say that she plays a role in policy making in regard, of, in regard of political, social and economic reform which is to be introduced into the judicial interpretation. And then he uh, talks about judicial independence versus political commitment. Being in a period of intensive and great uh, transformation, the relationship between judicial independence and the court's political commitment to the government and to the ruling of Chinese Communist Party has been of a critical concern for the latter, especially the conservative and somehow stuck board members thereof. Confronting the increasing westernized cry for democracy, rule of law and human rights protection, especially the cry for introduction of judicial review system in Chinese polity, the court has somehow swayed between the progressivism and conservatism. So he concludes, as the case has been, the power to interpret the law was deliberately vested into the legislature in accordance with the principle of democracy. Hence, it might not be constitutional for the Supreme Court to exercise such a function of abstract interpretation. However, it may not be practicable and desirable to reject the court's function of interpretation of law in concrete cases. Thank you.